Okay, so we're going to talk about the philosophy of language and mind in this, the last lecture. And then if you remember last week, I asked um, if there were some of you who'd like to stay on to look at the online courses. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through what the online course looks like, what you would have to do, with the sort of courses there are, uh, and how it works. Um, so I'll actually go online and do that for you so you can see exactly what it's like. Uh, but you don't have to stay for that if you don't want to. So at 3.30 you can even go and have a cup of coffee or stay on if you feel like it. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be half an hour, but something in that region. Okay, so let's look at the language and mind. Uh, philosophy of language uh, is literally the philosophy of language. I think I've mentioned to you before that the thing about philosophy is because it's content neutral, um, logic, the methodology we use, it doesn't matter in what area you use logic, language is one of the areas that you can do a philosophy of language. And that's exactly what language is. So la it looks at things like, uh, what is meaning? Because the thing about language is the words and sentences and what have you claim to have meaning. Well, what is meaning exactly? Very, very interesting and deeply philosophical question. Um, how do words refer to objects? So I told you that um, the photographer's name was Richard. Okay, how does the word Richard, which is just a sound after all, how does it refer to him? How, how does it do that? Is it some sort of magical... And if I mention uh, Madonna, okay, I've done it without the person being here. Um, but you still know who I mean. You know to whom I'm referring when I say Madonna. Some of you will, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, another question and related to those two is, how, how do we actually understand each other? Is, is the way I understand you different from the way I understand the physical world? So if I watch two billiard balls interacting uh, and I explain them in terms of cause and effect and I watch two of you conversing, do I explain that too in terms of cause and effect or is that an explanation of a different kind? Okay, so those are the questions that we look at. Well, there are many more questions in the philosophy of language, but those are the three I'm going to have a quick look at today, um, and then we'll go on to mind. So let's look first at meaning. So, so how does language have meaning? And all that is involved in language is the sounds that I'm making now, which are hitting your ears, um, I could be speaking in French and they could be hitting your ears without there being... Well, French is a bad example, isn't it? Let's say... Um, Japanese. Japanese, okay. And the sounds would be hitting your ears and, and there would be no understanding there, would there? My words would have no meaning to you unless I, you spoke Japanese. <laughs> and I spoke Japanese as well. <laughs> um, and... I could write on paper. I mean, I often write on the flip chart. You're reading writing on here. How do these squiggles on paper have meaning to you? How come you look at the word elephant or you hear the word elephant and you're immediately thinking of the animal elephant? How, how does that happen? And it's not just cause and effect either. It's not just that you've associated that word with that animal because you can do it without the animal there. Okay, there's more to meaning than just cause and effect. Um, one explanation of meaning is that we should think of meaning as the conditions of truth and falsehood. So, think about you're trying to explain the meaning of the word cat to a child. And I think I've used this example before, so I think you're picking it up straight away I hope. Uh, what would you do? You'd point out lots of different cats and some of them would be black, some of them would be ginger, some of them would be fat cats and some thin cats and some tabby and, and so on. Some old, some kittens. No, maybe not kittens. And what you'd be hoping is that the child would abstract away the essential catness of all the examples you're pointing to wouldn't you? That's what you're trying to do. And then what would you do to test the child's understanding that the, the, the child had acquired the meaning of the word cat? How would you do that? Show, Show another picture. And what? Of a different falling animal. 
Okay, and what? Go on, carry on, carry on. That won't do it. Ask him if that was a cat. You say, is that a pussy cat? No, and what is that? Oh, what is that? Perhaps you might say, what is that? Okay, but you'd, you'd probably start with, is that a pussy cat? We're, we're talking about teaching the child. You've got to give us a few clues to start off with, I reckon. <laughs> okay, and what would you wait for? You said you've shown us a picture of a horse. Of, of another four-legged animal. Okay. Probably a small dog. Because <laughs> the similarity. Um, is for cat and, and hope that he's learned the essence of cat and will say no. No, okay. So in testing the understanding that the child has got, you'll show it pictures of cats and say, is that a pussy cat? And hope to elicit the answer yes. You'll show pictures of dogs and other animals and hope to elicit the answer no. You'll sometimes say, what is that? And hope to elicit the answer a cat. Uh, and so on. So what are you actually testing for here? Well, what you're testing for is that the child has grasped the conditions under which that is a cat is true and that is a cat is false. Do you see what I mean? So you show it a picture of a cat and say, is this a pussy cat? And it says, yes. Thereby, or you show it a picture of um, a cat and say, what's that? And it says, it's a cat. And it's demonstrating that it knows the conditions under which this is a cat is true. And then you show it the dog and you say, is this a pussy cat? And the child says, no. It's demonstrating that it's understood the conditions under which this is a cat is false. Do you see what... I mean, so lots of people have thought that... If you ask the question, what is meaning? The answer is meaning are the conditions of truth, sorry, meaning is the conditions of truth and of falsehood of a sentence. Okay. Um, you've got to have the of and falsehood in there because if you show it the dog and it says this is a cat, then it clearly hasn't got it, has it? It's not understood yet. So what it's got to grasp in order to understand, to grasp the meaning of the sentence, this is a cat, it's got to know the conditions under which this is a cat is true and this is a cat is false. And once it's got those, you think it now knows the meaning, don't you? There isn't anything more the child has to do to show that it ha has understood the meaning. So lots of people have thought of the meaning as conditions of truth and falsity. That's what we're grabbing. And notice that meaning can't come apart from understanding. To know the meaning of a sentence is to understand that sentence, isn't it? Okay, so meaning, if you construct a theory of meaning, what you're doing is constructing a theory of what it is for people who speak a specific language to understand something. Okay, so meaning and understanding go together. Okay, so we're asking how does language have meaning? We've got a hypothesis here, maybe meaning constitutes the conditions of truth and falsehood. Um, but then we've got another question here. Well, is that right? Because if I write a sentence like this, um, Richard is a photographer. I'm trying to make people forget you, Richard. <laughs> okay, if I write Richard is a photographer, actually, no, I'm sorry, that's actually a very bad example because he's here and you know what I'm talking about. What I want to write is, John is tall. Okay, you understand that sentence, don't you? You understand what the meaning of that sentence is, do you? <coughs> Somebody said no. No, they won't admit to it anyway. <laughs> okay, you understand what that means, but now tell me its truth value. Is it true or false? Yes. It could be either, couldn't it? You don't know the truth value of that. But, but how can you know the meaning of something without being to de able to determine whether it's true or false? Let me ask that again. How can you know the meaning of something without being to able to determine whether it's true or false? There is an answer to this question, and I'll tell it to you in a minute, but let's see if you can get it first. Understand what, what they're suggesting, but you can't actually access whether it's correct or 
And why not? Why can't you? I mean, that was that was very good, but why? You haven't got the information. And which information do you need? You, you need to know what this word here refers to. What else do you need to know? What is tall means as well. Okay, um, what I've done here is I've written on the board a type of sentence. And we're now talking about sentences of this type. What I'm not doing here is using this sentence. Do you see what I mean? That's why it's got to have quotes round, because it's just a type of sentence, isn't it? It's a sentence that could be used to tell you something. So this sentence, and the reason that I suddenly realised it was a bad example, and if you see why it was a bad example, you've understood what I'm saying. Okay, this was a bad example because I said Richard is a photographer, having just introduced you to Richard the photographer. So of course you can determine the truth value of that, can't you? So I wasn't, I was mentioning that, but I had just used it and therefore I confused you. Whereas this one, I'm only mentioning, I'm not using at all. And it's only a, a sentence in use that has a truth value. Does that make sense? Oh, hold on, don't... One, two. You can understand abstract sentences that don't refer to a particular individual or quality as long as they have an internal coherence and obey the rules of grammar. Well, in effect, that's what I'm saying. This is a type of sentence which, which has... Okay. Uh, it has meaning, but it doesn't have full meaning, does it? Because you can't determine the truth value. What do you understand here? This is a sentence type that could be used uh, to say something. Okay, it could be used to say something, but it isn't being used to say something. I'm just talking about it. So I think, Anna, that's what you meant. But, but to use the technical terminology, this is a sentence type, not an abstract sentence, a sentence type which could be used to say something. And if I... Has anyone called John here? No? It must be the only room in <laughs> this number of people in who hasn't got somebody called John. That is so unfair. Uh, I'm going to call you John, sir. Uh, yes, you. Okay. Would you like to stand up? This is John. Okay, and now I'm going to use the sentence. I'm going to say, John is tall. Okay, now I'm using the sentence. And can you determine the truth value now? Of course, you need to understand what tall is, but, but most people, I think, would say yes, probably, here. What, what height are you, John? Five nine. Five nine. I, well, yes. we, I think that counts as tall. <laughs> okay. But do you see the difference between the meaning of a sentence that's not being used and the meaning of a sentence that is being used? In the first place, you grasp a meaning, but it's not enough to determine the truth value. In the second case, you, d you grasp the meaning and you know enough to determine the truth value. So in the first case, you know only the conditions of truth and falsehood. Okay, so you know a meaning that consists in nothing more than the conditions under which this sentence would be true. Are you with me? Whereas the minute I tell you to whom it refers, assuming you all understand what is tall means, you can then determine the truth value. So if you know the truth conditions plus the context, you can determine the truth value. Okay? So some people have said that meaning isn't the conditions of truth and falsity. It's actually uh, the use of uh, the conditions of truth and falsity, if you see what I mean. So the, the, this, if I write that on the board without using it at all, that doesn't have any meaning. What you're grasping in grasping <laughs> what it means, it's very difficult to not say what it means, is not the meaning. Okay, you're, you're grasping what it could be used to mean, but not its meaning. It's only when I actually make it concrete I just, I'm now picking up your vocabulary. It's only when I tell you to what John refers or to whom John refers that you then have 
proper meaning. So some people talk about weak and strong meaning, um, and some people say that weak meaning, this meaning, the meaning the way I'm not using it but just mentioning it, isn't meaning at all. And other people say this is meaning, but there's meaning and there's use and they're two different things. Uh, you had a question first, and I'll answer that. And then, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a bit out of topic now. Is I'm sorry. Saying, you said I'm, I'm not using that then. This is a specialised meaning of the word use, isn't it? Because you're using it as an example. Um, no, I'm. Oh, I'm using it as an example, but I'm not using the sentence to to express it. something. Yes, I did understand. Yeah, which is why I've got the quotes around it, yes. yeah. because it's it's very important that if I I can. Um, if I write that and that of which of those could I say it has five letters uh, I can't say what it says because um, one says chair and the other says chair with quotes around it Okay, of which of these could I say it has five letters? The bottom one, and only the bottom one, because here I'm using it to, to mean chair, and here, because they're quotes round, I'm talking about the word, aren't I? If I say chair with quotes round, I'm not talking about chairs at all, am I? I mean, it's very difficult to do this orally, of course. Um, but it, if I say chair has five letters, that's a grammatical sentence, isn't it? Whereas if I say chair has five letters, is that a grammatical sentence? No, it isn't. And that's because I, I'm, I'm not making it clear that I'm mentioning the word chair, not using the word chair. So there's a huge difference between use and mention. And instantly, hardly anyone these days understands that. Um, quotes are used very sparingly. And, and often wrongly, and actually it changes the meaning hugely. Um, so going back to this, when I first used John is oh, <laughs> used John is when I first put that sentence there, I wasn't using it. I was mentioning it, and then I was talking about it. And then when I used it to say John is tall, you could then determine the truth value, couldn't you? <laughs> and what point is there to meaning? if you can't determine truth value in the end. So if I utter a sentence of Russian now, have I given you, a, it's a meaningful sentence, but are you able to determine the truth value? Not unless you speak Russian. So the meaning that is completely useless to you, it sounds as if you don't grasp the meaning, at, well, you don't grasp the meaning at all. Sentence is meaningful, but you don't understand it. Um, What's going on if you're teaching English? And you're, and you're using John is taught to teach the verb to be. Are you using it or not using it? Well, what do you think? I don't know. I'm lost. What do other people think? Oh, okay. Uh, Anna's saying if I'm talking about John is tall in order to teach the verb to be, am I using or mentioning the sentence John is tall? Um. I'd, I'd probably be, I mean, actually, I could do both. Um, but if I'm saying John is tall, John and Susan are tall, um, John, Susan, and, uh, no, I am tall. I can't decline the verb. <laughs> um, what am I doing there? I'm teaching grammar. But am I using the sentence John is tall or mentioning it? I'm mentioning it, aren't I? In, I'm using the mention of it to teach grammar. See what I mean? I'm using the mention of the sentence to teach grammar. I am not using the sentence, John is tall. I do not intend to convey to you the information that John is tall. I intend to convey to you the information that is, is the correct. Got it? Okay. Um, Right, okay, so, so we've got two hypotheses here about what meaning is. One is that meaning is the conditions of truth and falsity of a sentence. So when you grasp the meaning, you grasp the conditions under which the sentence would be true or false if it were used. 
okay? So you look at John is tall and you grasp the meaning because you grasp the conditions under which a sentence like that, if it were used, would be true or false. Or you say, well, actually, it's a necessary condition of grasping meaning that you can determine the truth value. So you don't actually grasp the meaning of this at all. You only grasp the meaning when I say John is tall. Okay, so one theory is truth condition theory. So theories of meaning, one is truth condition theory and the second is use theory. And you may be interested to hear that both of them are attributable to other people as well, but um, preeminently Wittgenstein. The earlier Wittgenstein put forward truth condition theory, the later Wittgenstein put forward use theory, and he thought that if you, if you accepted use theory, you had to deny truth condition theory and vice versa. But, in fact, many people, and I'm one of them, think that actually you need both in order to have a full theory of meaning. And um, if you draw a representation of meaning, it's going to look something like this. And I may already have done this for you at some point. Do you remember? This is a, a representation of meaning. Firstly, we've got the strict and literal truth conditions. Truth and falsity conditions. I say truth conditions for short, but you should always hear falsity conditions as well. Uh, you could move that screen just in front of the Oh, Just the dark corner there. Is that? Yeah, okay. Um, can you still see the screen? That's the. How about that? Better? Okay. So I've got several concentric circles here. And in the centre, I've written strict and little truth conditions. So the door is shut. Now, you've all understood that, haven't you? You know, what have you understood there? The use or the meaning of the sentence? Oh, sorry, the, the truth conditions or the, uh, the use of the sentence? The door is shut. Truth conditions. Truth conditions. You've, you've understood how that sentence could be used if I used it. Okay, so I'll now use it. <laughs> the door, it's not the case. The door is shut. Okay. Um, so I've used that sentence embedded in another sentence because uh, I wanted to utter something true. But let me now utter something false. The door is shut. Was I using or mentioning that sentence? Using. I was using it then, wasn't I? And you can determine that it's false. Okay. So, shut it will I shut it? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> um, well, I say I will. But. Um, okay, now I can operate on that sentence in various ways. I can say, shut the door. Or I can say, is the door shut? Uh, or I can say, um, what else can I say? The door is shut. Uh, in each case, I'm using a different tone, aren't I? Assertoric tone, a little final case, interrogative tone, imperative tone, etc. So I'm operating on that sentence to, to change what I'm doing with it. Do you see what I mean? I'm using it in different ways here. So you've got one sentence or one set of strict and literal truth conditions plus a number of operations on that to change what I'm doing with it. Um, then I've got, uh, sorry, that was force, not, uh, that's the force with which I'm using the sentence, not the tone. Uh, tone is something different. Um, I mean, uh, uh, is the door shut yet? Okay, that's tone. Wasn't very good. I'm not a very good actress, but do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm being sarcastic, aren't I? Or something like that. Um, tone would... So, tone can sometimes change things a lot. I am not angry! <laughs> okay, what have I just said? You, the meaning you will have got from that is that I'm angry, won't you? 
it's not at all that, um, you know, I'm using the strict and literal tooth conditions with an acetoric force and a tone of, of, that makes it absolutely clear that you understand the complete opposite of what the strict and literal truth conditions are. Okay, so I can use those strict and literal truth conditions in many different ways depending on how I vary the force and the tone. And here's another one. Ask me whether so-and-so is a good philosopher. Ask me whether, sorry, what's your name? Peter. Peter. Ask me whether Peter's a good philosopher. Is Peter a good philosopher? Uh, his handwriting is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach you to say what you said earlier about that. <laughs> what have I just said? Exactly. You've all understood immediately, haven't you? Um, but have you understood because I used the strict and literal truth conditions in the normal way? No. The fact is the context changed everything, didn't it? But would you have understood what I said if you hadn't understood the strict and literal truth conditions? No. What you needed was the whole thing, didn't you? You needed to know that I was answering a question of, with a certain meaning with an answer that would be a perfectly good answer to a different question, but which is a... a, a um, an insultingly irrelevant answer to this particular question and therefore it means something different. The irrelevance alerts you to something, some change of meaning, if you like. So, if this is a representation of meaning, some people think that this is meaning all on its own. That's the truth condition theory of meaning. And other people think that you've got to have all of this before you have meaning. So that's the early Wittgenstein, the truth condition theory, and that's the late Wittgenstein, the use theory. And then there are people like me who think you've got to have both, that actually you've got to understand a set of strict and literal truth conditions before you can then operate on those strict and literal truth conditions in all the different ways to generate strong meaning. So I call that, and so do many other philosophers, this is not, not just me, weak meaning, and this is strong meaning. So meaning is ambiguous, the word meaning is ambiguous, and there are lots of different meanings of the word meaning, sadly. Um, but what I've done is gone through, we've got a question, how, do, how, do langu how does language have meaning at all? How do squiggles, how do um, sounds have meaning? One response is meanings are conditions of truth and falsity. Um, problem with that is we d it doesn't distinguish between use and meaning. So other people think that meaning is use. Um, and how do things like context contribute? Well, what they can suggest, they might suggest that one or other of those theories is true, or they could suggest that actually both are needed before you get full meaning. Because you certainly wouldn't have understood his handwriting is excellent if you hadn't understood both the strict and literal truth conditions and the context, would you? You had to get both of those to, to understand. And there are all sorts of other examples like that. If, if um, I'm just searching for a name here. Somebody give me a name. What's your name? Yeah. Eleanor. Eleanor. If Eleanor had been um, late every single time to this lecture and 10 minutes she runs in and slams the door as usual and I say, hello, Eleanor, early again. Okay, what have I said? Late. That she's late. So you know that the tone of sarcasm... <laughs> together with the context that you knew, turns the meaning round again. Um, and you know that because you are English speakers, you understand the meaning of English. Okay. It's certainly the case that you, uh, you have to be an English, in being an English speaker and being an American speaker, and there are different contexts, different tones, different forces, well, I don't think they're different forces. I mean, in lots of different languages, they use different 
conventions to do the same thing. So this is where the fact that I'm monoglot doesn't help me. But can anyone give me an example of where... Would you not like to go for a walk? Uh, <laughs> yes, that's an interesting one. <laughs> okay, that shows you that Irish is, is it Irish? It's different from English. <laughs> okay, yeah, good one. Um, and there are all sorts of others, actually. If you, um, no, I'm sorry, I can't think of a single example. But you can te tenses can be done differently in different languages, can't they? Questions can be done differently in different languages. So um, each language is different. And of course, the problem of how to individuate a language, and you might say Irish and English are the same language, or you might say they're different for, for that very reason. Um, sorry? The American on the daily show. Right. Well, oh, people. Now he's done so and so. Right. Well, that's sarcasm rather than yeah. irony, isn't it? I, yeah. It's uh, it's supposed to be the, the case that Americans don't use irony. I'm sure I have heard Americans the using French irony, French but don't do irony. the French don't do irony. I'm sure that must be true. <laughs> Are there any French people? Here? <laughs> Well, when, you, when you're doing philosophy of language, you're, you're not really interested in that. You're interested in the normal conveyance of meaning and so on. So, would it, would it not interest? Oh, yeah. To, if you know what I mean, uh, to, because um, if, if, that, if, if the person doesn't understand it the same way, don't, don't philosophers want to examine that? Um, of course, but they wouldn't particularly be interested in examining... Um, a malfunctioning speaker of language. And in this case, there is a malfunction. Do you, do you see what I mean? If you want to understand the phenomenon itself, you, you will look at normal functioning of that phenomenon. And then you might go from that to look at abnormal functioning. And, and that indeed might throw some light on it. Um, in fact, we'll talk a bit about something like that later on. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Okay, one more question. Um, I, I always thought meaning was something about value rather than truth. I mean, I haven't thought about it very truth at all, truth, but I, it, to me, something that has to be meaningful to a person is, not, is, is valuable to them. But isn't, it, isn't truth valuable? <clears throat> I mean, if, um, if I, when I was talking ethics, I, about ethics, I said to you, what would happen if you couldn't suppose that most people are telling the truth most of the time? What would happen if you couldn't uh, rely on the fact that most people tell the truth most of the time? Communication. It, it, communication would break down completely, wouldn't it? Because what would be the point of it? I ask you what's on at the cinema, you tell me, and then I think, well... Can I believe her? <laughs> um, so truth is hugely valuable. Um, and the exchange of information, and of course we're not just talking about information about the cinema. If I say I love you, uh, I'm of course mentioning that sentence rather than using it at the moment. But if I were to... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but if I say I love you, I'm giving information, aren't I? But, it, but it's information of a different kind from the theatre, but it's still the case that you hope that the conditions under, you know, that make that sentence true would actually obtain if I said that sentence to you in a, in a situation, the right situation. Uh, and you'd be very upset if, if they didn't. So there is a lot of value in meaning, but the value is usually attached to truth. And it's usually the truth about all sorts of things that we value, like love. For example, or Does it different people seem to find meaning in different things? Oh, you're talking about meaning in a, in a rather metaphorical sense here. I mean, uh, it, there's another sense of meaning, the meaning of a picture or a painting or something like that, the meaning of a, you know, what's the meaning of the fact she's wearing that dress? Do you see what I mean? That, that's a secondary meaning of meaning, isn't it? And I'm talking about philosophy of language, 
So I'm talking about the meaning of sentences, words, and so on, rather than the meaning of paintings or dresses or or whatever, or, or life, yes. You've got to do 20 years of logic before you can do the meaning of life. I'm on the meaning of life, but you're not. Even then you can't tell the answer, though, can you? Uh, well, we could do another few lectures, if you like. <laughs> I think we'd need quite a few. No, I'm only just starting the, beginning, the meaning of life. I've been lecturing for 22 years now. I've just started on the meaning of life. So, sorry, I, I thought the lady behind us was, was actually talking about, you know, it means something. Well, if she was. But this is yeah. an emotional thing. But uh, what's the meaning of her wearing that dress? I mean, that's an emotional thing, isn't it? She knows I have another. She knows I was going to wear that dress today. Why is she wearing that one, which she knows clashes with it? That's an emotional thing. You know, I love you. Doesn't that have an emotional meaning? I hate you. <laughs> Um, yes, of course there's an emotional meaning, but, but the meaning is that in order to get the emotion behind my utterance of something, you've got to understand the strict and literal truth conditions of it. If you don't understand the conditions under which I love you is true, then you won't get any emotional response when I say I love you, because you won't know what it means. Do you see what I mean? The emotion is secondary, it's nothing to do with the meaning. It's to do with understanding the meaning, but it's understanding the meaning is what causes whatever emotion you have. Ugh, horror, perhaps. So if you said, that man means something to me. Would well, that's the secondary that. metaphorical meaning of meaning. So that painting has a certain meaning to me is not talking about language, is it? It's talking about a painting. And I'm talking about philosophy of language. That man is not a sentence. He's a man. So, so that's not the meaning, the sort of meaning I'm talking about. I, d I said to you that meaning is multiply ambiguous. I, I don't know One more question, and th then I think we must move on. Just, just to help out in that example, <coughs> you use the word significance for meaning. Well, we can call it anything we like, but I think most people use meaning to that use meaning in that context. So. You know, we'd be changing language if we did that, and that's not usually a good thing to do. It's a much better thing to do to understand why um, the word meaning is used in that way as well as the other way. Okay, so that's, that's meaning. Um, we're going to run out of time here, I can see. Um, how do words refer to objects? So far I've talked about meaning, and meaning is actually... A, um, a function of sentences. It's sentences that have meaning, not words. Uh, let me convince you of this. If I say chair, what have I said? Word. Thank you. Yes, I have said chair. But what, what, what's a word? Have I said anything with meaning? I haven't, have I? Have I given you anything with conditions of truth and falsehood? No. Have I given you anything, have I used the word chair in any meaningful way? No. Okay. What I've got to give you to get meaning is a structured thing. Okay. One word will not do it. There are, you might think there are one word sentences. If I say go, I've given you a, something with truth conditions, haven't I? Or I've given you an order. It's, not got, it's got fulfillment conditions because it was a, a command rather than truth conditions. But you see what I mean. But where is the structure in that? Go! Well, it's imperative, and it's um, a verb. Yes, so there's it's more to it than that. There's a structure somewhere, isn't it? They're actually... So there's a subject verb. Go somewhere. You've got to go somewhere. Uh, you go there. The, so the demonstration is part of the structure. The implicit you, which comes from the fact it's an, an imperative form, that you go there is a sentence. <laughs> You've got something that has truth conditions now, whereas go, if I don't talk to you and I don't demonstrate, has no meaning, does it? So in order to get meaning, you've got to have a sentence, something with structure. Uh, a word does not have meaning except in its contribution to a sentence. So when you're looking at a sentence like this... I swear I won't be able to find it now. 
John is tall. Um, okay, it's composed of meaning of, of words. And of course, this is important because Mary loves John has a different meaning from John loves Mary, doesn't it? So you, it's not just the meaning of the words that matters or the contribution made by the words to the sentence. It's also the way those words are combined. So it's the grammar, the syntax, as well as the semantics of the word. So to understand that, you've got to understand to whom John refers. And of course, you might not even know that John is a name. So you've got to know to what John refers. Uh, and you've got to know um, what is tall means. Okay, well, how do we do this? Well, let me tell you. Okay, I'm going to introduce a new word for you here. Um, okay, would you stand up and turn and face everyone? And would you do the same? And uh, John, would you do the same, please? And Roger? And I think that's it. Okay, now all these people are grosh. Okay, they're all grosh. I'm not grosh, and neither is Anna. Stand up, Anna, and turn. Okay, Anna's not grosh either. Um, I've forgotten your name again. Peter, Peter isn't grosh. Okay, have we understood what is grosh means yet? Yeah? Is wearing glasses. Yep. Okay, sit down, everyone. Thank you very much. How do you spell gross, do you think? <laughs> yes, I think it's about that, isn't it? Okay, the way I got you to understand that was by um, identifying a class of people as gross and identifying a few others. Do you see what I was doing? I was giving you the truth conditions of is gross, when it's true that something is gross and when it's false that something is gross. And so what you're doing when you're understanding words as opposed to sentences is understanding the contribution that they make to the truth conditions of a sentence. Okay? So in understanding your sentence, you're grasping the truth conditions and possibly also the use. And in understanding a word, you're grasping the condition that, sorry, the contribution made by those words to a sentence in which the word's used. And once you've understood is grosh, you can understand it in different contexts, can't you? Would you stand up, please, and turn and face people? Yes. Are you, is this person grosh or not? Yes. yes. yes there you are. Okay. So you can understand things like, here's a question, do zebras wear overcoats? <laughs> not often someone says okay well you the fact is you've never heard that sentence before unless you've heard me lecture before in which case you probably have um, but you all understood it immediately don't you and this is because words are the uh, if you like the tools the atoms that you put together in various combinations and this gives you an, a potentially infinite understanding doesn't it you don't have to have heard a sentence before to understand what it means. You understand the atoms and their combination. So you understand the meaning of the words and the meaning of the rules of combination, and that gives you a potentially infinite understanding. Okay, so how do we get to know that words refer? Well, some people have said ostensive definition. Um, if I had pointed to um, dot. dot and said, dot is grosh, stand up. Okay, dot is grosh. <laughs> um, would you have understood what I meant? No. I'd say, look, she's grosh. No. Why not? New. You're new to the word, but why, why, look, I'm ostensively defining. You've got no yeah. And what, what is it? As I'm pointing, can I point to her grossness, even if I go like this? <laughs> no? Okay, the thing is, I can't point to any one aspect of anything, can I? If I point to a cat and say cat, it could easily mean the, the colour of the cat, or the shape of the cat, or the whiskers on the cat, or the, I mean, uh, Quine, on whom there's incidentally a, a weekend school next weekend, Quine says, uh, if, if you're in a foreign country and somebody points at a rabbit and says, gather guy, okay, do you assume that gather guy means rabbit, or 
Does it mean rabbit flies? Because in this particular country, there are flies that always fly around rabbits. Um, so you never see a rabbit without seeing rabbit flies. So am I ostensibly defining gather guy by pointing to the rabbit or the rabbit fly? And how are you going to distinguish that? Or do I mean by gather guy, undetached rabbit part? <laughs> Uh, in other words, I mean part of a rabbit that isn't detached from a rabbit because you never get those without getting rabbits, do you? So how do you know that gather guy means rabbit as opposed to rabbit fly or undetached rabbit part or... Or shoot it. Yes, it could be or, or shoot it, yes, exactly. Or yes, or something, something like that. That might be a bit different. Um, well, just thinking... I think you, if you were telling somebody that something was dangerous, you'd probably do something more than ostensibly define it. You'd say, oh. you know, something. Anyway, never mind. That's a maybe. Maybe you wouldn't. In which case, fine. Um, okay. So, ostensive definition. It can't be an explanation. Also, how do you ostensibly define the word five? Um, you know, it's impossible, isn't it? Or, or how about the word and? How do you ostensibly define the word and? And yet somehow you've all managed to pick up the word and, haven't you? You know exactly what it means. But it wasn't because your mum ostensibly defined it for you. That might have been how you learnt how the word is written. But of course that's a very different thing from learning the meaning of the word. So it means pointing. Demonstrative definition, if you, if you prefer. Um, another question is, um, if we take a name like um, Anna, um, okay, is the meaning of, of Anna, notice I'm using quotes here, so I'm mentioning the name rather than using it, does the name Anna just have a reference, and when you grasp the meaning, you grasp its referent, Okay, or does it have a sense as well? Okay, so here's a word, and here's another word. I don't know if I'm spelling them properly. This says Hesperus, this says Phosphorus. Okay, now um, these. You might think if they're, um, they're both the word, the name for Venus, sorry, they are both names for Venus, the planet Venus, which appears both in the morning and in the evening. So Hesperus became associated with, and here's where I show my ignorance again, I can't remember whether it was the morning star or the evening star, but let's say the morning star, and Phosphorus became associated with the, the evening star. Okay, so Hesperus and Phosphorus have the same referent. But you don't know that, do you, initially? I mean, um, imagine yourself before astrolog astrologers, <laughs> astronomers had shown that Hesperus was phosphorus, that the star we see in the morning is the very same star that we see in the evening. You would have been very interested to learn that Hesperus is phosphorus, wouldn't you? And yet, if to grasp the meaning of a word, all you need to know is its referent, then surely you would have known that because you know the referent of Hesperus, you know the referent of Phosphorus, and they are the same thing. So you should have known that long ago. You didn't. So the thought is that Hesperus and Phosphorus must have something other than reference as meaning. They must have a sense as well. And some people have thought that what the sense is, if here's Venus, okay, and phosphorus is one mode of presentation of Venus, and Hesperus is another mode of presenting Venus. So you could talk about me as um, Miss Talbot, or you could talk about me as Marianne. In both cases, you refer to me, but you use names with different, re uh, different ways of presenting the same referent. And of course, every referent has numerous ways of, okay, so I could uh, point to you as the woman in the um, orange and pink scarf, or the woman sitting next to the chap with a beard and long hair, or the woman sitting behind Anna. And all these are different ways of getting at you, 
different modes of presentation of you, and I could associate a name with each of those, like the woman with the pink and orange scarf is Susan, okay? The woman sitting next to the uh, man with a beard and long hair is Jennifer, and then I can tell you that Susan is Jennifer. I don't know why I'd bother doing that, but you can see the, <laughs> the principle. Okay, so uh, ostensive definition can't be an explanation of how words refer. Um, the reference of words can't be their, their meaning all on their own. They've got to have sense as well. And then, of course, there are different types of referent. Okay, um, Dot, stand up. Sorry, I'm keeping, keeping your fit here. Okay, now sit down again. Okay, now everybody stand up, please. It'll keep you all on your toes, won't it? <laughs> okay, now sit down if you're male. Okay, sit down if you're wearing dark colours, all dark colours. It's a bit ambiguous, I know, but okay. Sit down if you're not Grolsch. No, well, you're not at the moment, so sit down. <laughs> okay. Oh, Freudian slip. Walsh is the drink. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shut up, Anna. <laughs> uh, sit down if you're wearing anything brown. Or fawn. Isn't that fawn, that jump? Grey. Oh, right, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but sit down there. Okay, so you can sit down anyway. Um, sit down if your hair is dark. Sit down if you're wearing a pinafore. Sit down if you're wearing a white T-shirt. Sit down if you're wearing uh, orange. Or if you've got on a black jacket. Or if you're wearing a grey jumper. Oh, it's blue. <laughs> okay. I've got left one person. <laughs> so, Dot is the person who is not wearing any of these things. Okay, so I can uniquely I refer to Dot either by throwing a harpoon at her using a, a refer referring term, a designator, Dot stand up, you can stand up, or I can pick out Dot by describing her uniquely. And I could do this in another way. Here's another way of doing it. Stand, oh no, damn. Um, stand up and there's someone else wearing a pink jumper at the back, which is very irritating. Um, sorry, it's a very nice pink jumper, but you see what I'm um, Stand up if you're wearing a pink, pink jumper over a pink and grey shirt. Yes! <laughs> That was easier, wasn't it? <laughs> um, so do you see that there are different types of reference? There's either a, a, a harpoon, if you like, I can go straight for the person, or I can throw a net over everything and, and pick out just one thing by a description. Okay, I'm using a description to uniquely refer to. So descriptions are designators as much as names are. Um, but, of course, they, they designate or refer in a completely different way, don't they? So one's like a harpoon, the other's like a net. Um, and we often have to use a net, uh, but we can oft also go wrong. If I say, would the person drinking martini stand up? Uh, seeing you drinking from a martini glass. No, you can keep sitting down. Uh, but actually, she's got water in her martini glass, and so my reference goes wrong very difficult questions about how do I succeed in referring to you nevertheless because you're not drinking martini so the description is false um, and yet I do manage to do that how, how do I do that well I didn't need to be more precise though I managed to get you even though my reference didn't fit didn't I so uh, yes okay uh, but that was due to the lack of a martini glass <laughs> rather than the lack of martini 
<laughs> okay, so um, lots of questions in how do words refer. Now, just quickly, we've got to go on to mind, and this is, let's, how do we understand each other? Uh, one group of people say, we use a theory. So just as I uh, explain the physical world in terms of cause and effect and in terms of um, postulating theories and then looking for uniformities in cause and effect, so I, how do I understand you? Well, I think, you know, well, here's a person of a certain age, of a certain type, of a certain, you know, so when they say this, it'll mean this. Um, lots of people would say, well, actually, that's not good enough because... If, I've got to, if I'm going to understand you, I've got to understand you in all your individuality. And what I ought to be doing is, is if you say something crazy, instead of saying, well, that person's obviously crazy and not listening to you anymore, I've got to say, why is that rational person saying something that sounds crazy? I must have misunderstood her. Okay, so what do you mean? You ask another question. So this one says that we understand each other on the principle of the uniformity of nature exactly like any other um, part of the physical world. There's no difference at all between you and this chair in terms of my understanding your behaviour. Um, charity says, no, in order to understand things like you, I've got to use the principle of charity, not just the principle of the uniformity of nature. And simulation theory tells me that um, not only have I got to use, oh, no, actually, not, maybe not even, but I can't just use this because what I've got to do is simulate you. I've got to put myself in your position. And when I do that, it's, it, I'm not putting myself in your position because when I do that, I only get me, don't I? Um, what I'm doing is I'm trying to see the world through your eyes. So I'm not um, tr just putting myself in your position. I'm transforming myself into you in my imagination in order to understand what you mean. So when I hear you say there are tickets for Madonna tonight, instead of thinking, oh, is that interesting? I think, oh, my God, and I know how much Dot likes Madonna. That is, and I say, oh fantastic dot because I've transformed myself into dot and I see that she's telling me this because she wants me to, to enthuse with her about Madonna do you see what I mean so there's simulation so these are three different theories about how you understand people and believe me that people are nearly in blows on these theories at the moment because uh, I, I actually think that you've got to use all three I mean, it seems to me that this isn't an either-or. It's definitely a use of all three. But some people think that it's either one or the other. Um, and whichever combination you can either get... Some people believe it's theory, theory, and charity, but definitely not simulation. And other people believe it's simulation, charity, definitely not theory. And there are all sorts of permutations. But the theory of interpretation is a very big area in philosophy. Excuse me. If we use all three... Be sure that you definitely understand another person. Sorry, say that again. If you, are, if you are using all three theories, could you be sure of understanding another person? I don't think you can ever be sure of understanding another person because, I mean, if, if say you were not a natural English speaker, I've no idea whether you are or not, but um, you had learnt English from a dictionary and da 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 da, and I said his handwriting is excellent, um, you. Use of theory theory, she's speaking English, this is an English sentence, wouldn't get you anywhere, would it? Uh, use of charity, you might see that the answer I'm giving is not an answer to the question, but would you understand me? Use of simulation, well, again, would you understand me? As, no, so I, I think these are perhaps, you know, in whatever combination you like, necessary conditions for understanding, but I doubt... I, I think it would be virtually impossible to, to give any theory of meaning which would guarantee that were you to know that theory, that would be sufficient to understand anyone. Goodness, I speak English pretty well, but that doesn't guarantee that I understand things that people say to me. Um, in fact, often I don't. I wasn't meaning from the language point of view, but from as, well, understanding a person, you know. Which includes language and all sorts of other things. And, and yeah. Yeah. No, no, well, as I said, I am not angry. <laughs> it's not just language you're understanding there, is it? Um, 
and go. It's not just language you're understanding there either, is it? Okay, let's move on to minds, because we left all of half an hour for this. Um, <laughs> philosophy of mind focuses on questions like, um, what is a mental state? Uh, I wonder what that was then. Okay, okay what is a mental state? Um, how does the mental interact with the physical? Uh, and what's the nature of rationality and consciousness? And I'm going to look at those, I think, yes, here we are, uh, each of them separately, briefly. Okay, so looking at the nature of mental states, Descartes thinks that the mind is quite distinct from the body, that, that they are not the same thing at all. And the reason he thinks that, if you remember, is because he opens up a gap um, between the mind and the world, and in that gap is this pussycat here, <laughs> the demon. Okay, um, but let's have a think about this for a minute. Um, in the world, we've got things like pens, chairs, um, human bodies. Um, we've got uh, relations between these things like causation, haven't we? So there are events also like um, sounds. Um, there's spatial relations, so Anna is sitting on a chair, or there's a human body sitting on a chair there. So there's spatial relations between these things. Um, there are temporal relations between events. Okay, now, now let's look at the mind. Um, what sort of um, objects are mental objects? I'll give you a few. There are beliefs, aren't there? Desires intentions okay the, these are mental states now oh I'm sorry I forgot to do their properties here things like blue hard square okay fair enough now are any of these blue no hard square it's completely wrong, isn't it? What are the properties of mental things? So thinking, thinking about a belief at the moment, what sort of property does a belief have? This belief is... Strong. Uh, strong, yes, okay, there are degrees of um, certainty, shall we put? Because so, a strong belief is a belief of which you're certain, let's say. Degrees of justification is probably a better of justification. Sorry, say this again. I think, isn't that the same yeah, thing? No, oh, thank you. No, I'm going to put justification because colours come in intensities too, but it's a different thing, isn't it? Okay, what, what else are beliefs? Beliefs are true or false. True or false. They're justified or unjustified. They're true or false. What else are they? Acquired or innate, you could say that. Yeah, acquired or innate. Okay, what else are they? Unfair. unfair. I'm not sure beliefs are unfair. Intentions might be. Um, beliefs just seem to be truth-related rather than value-related, aren't they? Um, uh, again, that would be degrees of justification, wouldn't it? Because an untested belief would be an unjustified one. What about, they have content, They're, they have intentionality, to use a technical term. You can't have a belief that doesn't have a content, can you? Okay, could you have a belief that doesn't have the content, the chair is blue, or Dot's wearing pink, or Peter's wearing blue, or every belief has got to have a content, hasn't it? That means it's got to have intentionality, C on ality. It's got an S, not a, not a T. Um, it, it's a technical term. Don't, it, it, all it means is aboutness. Every belief has aboutness. That it's got to be about something or other. Um, okay. What about relations between these things? I mean, um, do they have spatial relations? Do you get one belief on top of another? You can metaphorically, perhaps, you know, one belief is coming on top of another, but, but not literally, can you? Can you have one belief uh, beside another? 
and you can have one chair beside another, can't you? You can have one pen beside a flip chart. Can you have beliefs beside each other in that way? Again, metaphorically, but not literally. Actually, there aren't any spatial relations here at all, are there, in the mind? You don't get a desire on top of a belief. Uh, you don't get a, an intention inside a desire. Okay, so um, there aren't any... The, the, are there temporal relations between beliefs? There are temporal relations, aren't there, between mental states? So I had that desire before I formed that belief. Okay, and now I've formed that belief, I, I've lost that desire. So there are temporal relations. Um, there's another type of relation between beliefs and desires, um, and those are rational relations. Normally I would have made you tell me that, but we haven't got time. Um, so if I say, uh, if the dog barks, um, if there are strangers, the dog will bark. There are strangers, therefore the dog will bark. Okay, there are rational relations between those two beliefs. We talked about them when we did logic. So if the first two beliefs are true, the third belief will be true, won't it? So there are rational relations between beliefs. Okay, now let's look at this again. Um, do pairs, pens and chairs enter into rational relations? <coughs> no? Okay. Do uh, pens have intentionality? Are they about things? No? Okay. Um, do human bodies have rational relations with each other? I'm not talking about human minds here. Okay. Human bodies have spatial relations, don't they? I'm in front of you. What's your name? Eileen. 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 Okay, I'm in front of Eileen. So human bodies have that. Is my mind in front of Eileen's mind? It would be a very funny thing to say, wouldn't it? Um, what about, can pens be true? Is this pen true? It may make a sentence true, mightn't it? This pen is blue, is made true by this pen. But it is not itself true. If there weren't any beliefs, in fact, or sentences that express beliefs, there wouldn't be any truth. Um, one major question here is, can beliefs cause? Are, are there causal relations between beliefs? What do you think? Okay. Um, you're right, but actually causation within the mind is usually a malfunction. If my desire that my husband is, ha is having, not having an affair, not having an affair, um, causes my belief that he isn't having an affair, okay, am I, is something going right here? It isn't, is it? Because the fact is that the desire that my husband isn't having an affair is no reason at all for the belief he isn't having an affair. Is it? What I've got there is, is wishful thinking. And then there's association. One belief can cause another simply because I've associated the two beliefs in my mind. But of course, the relation you want between your beliefs and indeed between your desires and beliefs and so on is rational relations, not simply causal relations. Um, sometimes, you know, there's nothing wrong necessarily with having causal relations between your beliefs. Association is quite useful in many cases. Um, but actually, without reason, you'd be in serious trouble. It's rational relations you want between your beliefs, not causal ones. So when you ask, uh, are mental states physical states? Well, um, physical things like pens don't seem to have any of the properties or relations that mental states have. Mental states, like beliefs, don't seem to have any of the properties or relations that physical states go in for. So beliefs can't be blue or square or hard. Or So why should we think that mental states are the very same thing as physical states? And yet, well, funny enough, we're about the first generation who has assumed that mental states are physical states because we know that the brain is very important to the mind and we just assume, therefore, that they are the same thing. 
But how can they be? Ah! <laughs> what does it say? A father's about to be sent to my machine. Oh, how alarming. Execute now, I bought. Oh! <laughs> Dear me. Um, yeah, so, so when you hear people on the television using the word brain instead of mind, you should say, oh, they shouldn't be doing that at all. And when you hear yourself doing it, you should be ashamed of yourself. Um, it may be that mental states turn out to be physical states, but actually um, it's hugely unlikely that they will. And if you study philosophy of minds for any length of time, you'll see that knee-jerk <laughs> physicalism the idea that mental states are physical states. So my belief that P is nothing more than a brain state of mine, um, you'll see that actually that's hugely unlikely. Here's another reason for thinking it's unlikely. Um, okay, I'm having a belief about... No, let's use Dot. She's got that nice pink jumper. <laughs> okay, I'm having a belief... I'm, I'm thinking about Dot now. I'm thinking that Dot is wearing a pink jumper. Now, if Dot didn't exist... Could I have that belief, that very belief? Do you think not? I could have a belief very like it, couldn't I? I could have a belief about a woman wearing pink who's sitting in front of me. In other words, I could have a belief about a description of someone very similar to Dot. But could I have the belief that Dot is wearing a pink jumper? Could I have a belief about Dot at all? if dot didn't exist. No, it doesn't seem as if I could, could I? Well, if that's true, given that I would have whatever brain state I have that's underpinning my belief about dots wearing a pink jumper, um, I could have that, couldn't I? Whether dot existed or not, because what goes on inside my brain is, is, goes on quite independently of dot's existence or not, and yet, I couldn't have a belief about dot if dot didn't exist. So my having a belief, of, it's being true of Marianne that she has a belief about dot is dependent upon the existence of dot, whereas Marianne's having the brain state that underpins her belief about dot is completely independent of dot's existence or not. So how can that brain state be the very same thing as my belief? It couldn't be. So it may well be that brain, brain states are necessary conditions of having beliefs, that the relation between brain states and mental states is hugely important, but it is not one of identity. They are not the same thing. So when you hear yourself using brain states when you should be using mental state, you'll smack yourself on the wrist and say, Marianne wouldn't like that and you'll stop doing it. And if you want to understand more about why, you should do a course on philosophy of mind. Although you've got to pick your course, because it would have to be a course on beliefs rather than qualitative states or something. Okay. Um, ah, now you've asked an interesting question there, because look, you've asked where in space is my mind? But minds don't enter into spatial relations. So you, you're... Because you're modelling the mind on the model of a physical object, you're asking a question that would be a question you'd obviously have, because no physical object could exist without existing in space. But the question of whether a mind exists in space, well, you want to say, I want to say, um, minds don't exist in space. Well, no, you can't ask that because it's not aware. They don't exist where at all. They don't enter into spatial relations. If, if the mind were the brain, then my mind would be inside my head, wouldn't it? And if my mind were inside my head, my belief that Dot is wearing a pink jumper would also be inside my head. And isn't that where it 